Well, we're looking at the different words which are used to describe a Christian in the New Testament. Tonight we come to the word believer. Well over 200 times in the New Testament you find the word believe. And over 80 times you find Christians described as those who believe. Or it's recorded that such and such a person or group of people believe. And the word belief is a key word in understanding the Christian faith. Of course the word believe or one who believes or believer uh, simply means a person who has faith. In the Greek language in which the New Testament was written the word faith and faithful and belief and believe and believer uh, are all words in the same family. A believer is someone who has faith and once we're clear on what faith is we will be clear on what a believer is. If you can answer the question, do I have faith? You can also answer the question, am I a Christian? A Christian is someone who has faith. A Christian is a believer. Now tonight we divide the message into two and you'll see it's clearly on the sheet. First of all, we'll find out what faith is because you may not have it. And then we'll find out how faith behaves. And that will be a further test as to whether you have it. Now faith is three things. It is not just the first. Most people in Britain have the first. It is not just the second. Many people in Britain have the second. It is the third also. A few people in Britain also have the third. Faith is not one of those things. It is not two of those things. It is all three. And anyone who does not have all three does not have faith. Anyone who does not have faith is not a believer. Anyone who is not a believer is not a Christian. So we're going to learn some Latin tonight which is a bit of a joke for me because I was thrown out of Latin at school but our forefathers quite correctly used three words and I've put them on the sheet in brackets because you may come across these words sometime and it would be helpful if you weren't quite clueless uh, about it. First of all faith is knowledge. Faith is something that you know about. They have taken note of. Faith is no tisha. It is knowledge. Will you come? We're going to look at most of these verses tonight. Come to Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Nobody can have faith. Nobody has faith unless they know certain things. They've got to hear certain things. There must be certain facts with which they are acquainted. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Imagine a king who is giving out free food to beggars. Well, the very first thing that a beggar must do before he comes to such a king is he must hear that there is such a king. And he must hear that this king really does give out free food to beggars. If he never hears of the king and he never hears what the king does, he will never come to the king. If people never hear of Christ and who he is and what he's done, they will never come to Christ. The first step in all evangelism is to go and tell gospel facts so that people may know who God is, who Christ is, what sin is, what repentance is, what faith is. Their minds must be fed with facts. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 now. All the references are on the sheet. And you'll see that when Paul arrived in Corinth to preach the gospel for the first time, the first thing that he did was he taught the people certain facts. 
You can't believe facts to be true if you haven't heard the facts. So faith is first of all knowledge. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. And here is a summary of the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. First of all he told them about Christ. The Old Testament promised that God himself would come into the world as a man. So he told them about this Christ, the God-man. Then he told them that Christ died. He told them about a historic fact that Jesus of Nazareth, the great God-man, was crucified. Then he told them that Christ died for our sins. That crucifixion wasn't an accident and it wasn't without meaning. Jesus Christ was bearing the punishment of the sins of others when he died. Then he told them that it was according to the scriptures. This is exactly what the Old Testament promised. And then he told them how Christ was buried and raised again and seen so that they might be perfectly confident that those who died bearing the punishment of other people's sins was alive and an ever-living ever saviour. And therefore he told them what he told them in Acts 13. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that by this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Faith is first of all certain facts. Nobody can be saved who does not know those basic facts. That God is. That sin is the breaking of his law. That sin must be punished everlastingly by an everlasting God. That Christ bore the sins and the punishment of them, the punishment which was due to others because he was innocent, that he's alive forevermore as an ever-living saviour, that because of him alone forgiveness of sins is preached and declared to a guilty world. They must know those facts. Now the second aspect of faith is that faith is a sense. A census. It's a sense. Someone hears the facts and most people in Britain at some time or another have heard the facts. But they don't believe those facts to be true. They haven't heard those facts explained. So often they're very clear, unclear and perplexed and mixed up. But the second step in faith is to believe the facts to be true. So it's not enough to tell people the facts. They've got to believe the facts to be true. And that is where the art of persuasion comes in. A gospel preacher announces not only the facts, but he seeks to persuade the people that these facts are true. Where are these facts found? In the Bible. So he'll need to explain to people why we believe the Bible to be true. And so on. And brings the art of persuasion to people's minds until someone believes that what he's heard is true. If you look at Acts 17, you'll see that Paul spent a great deal of time in persuasion. We read that Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed. He patiently answered their questions. Some of them had objections. So he opened and alleged and disputed and reasoned and showed the folly and the futility of their objections. He told them the facts and then he sought to bring them to the place where they knew those facts to be true. Nobody in the world is saved unless they believe the facts of the gospel to be true facts. There is an error in history called Sandemanianism. Perhaps that doesn't interest you very much. But it constantly changes his clothes and creeps into every generation and it's here again. Modern Sandemanians come up to you by the bus stop with a little booklet and it starts, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Do you believe that? Yes. 
you're a great sinner and you need your sins forgiven do you believe that? yes Jesus Christ is the son of God the saviour of sinners do you believe that to be true? yes and they get people to say yes to certain facts to assent and very often people are assured on the basis that they believe certain facts to be true they are told that they have saving faith the fact that you believe God is the God of the scripture is the true God doesn't mean that you're, that you're a believer the devil believes that the fact that you believe the Bible to be true doesn't mean that you're a Christian the devil believes that the fact that you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God who died for sinners and is alive to save them forevermore doesn't make you a Christian believer the devil believes that too Faith is not just knowing the facts, it's not just assenting to the facts. It's much more than that, it's one step further than that. It's very important that we stress that today. You go up to lots of people who've had a Sunday school experience and ask them who Jesus is and you'll get a correct answer. But they're not Christians. And many, many folk have been to the front of evangelistic rallies because they believe that the things that they've heard are true but they're not Christians faith is not just knowledge it is not just assent it is trust and our forefathers call that fiducia it is trust because I hear the facts I believe the facts to be true I believe the facts to be true for me personally and so I move beyond the facts and trust the person who is declared in those facts. When the Apostle Paul was asked by the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? He didn't say, here's a list of gospel facts, believe those. The Apostle said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved not enough to have the facts in your mind you must come to the person you must trust the person the apostle John says in his gospel to as many as received him gave he authority to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name and that's gospel in a nutshell which we read again this evening John 3.16 it says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life that's, that's what faith is someone hears the news they believe it to be true and believing that Jesus Christ really did die for sinners and believing themselves to be a sinner and believing that Jesus Christ really does receive sinners and believing themselves to be a sinner and believing that there's no hope of everlasting life except in Jesus Christ that person personally approaches Jesus Christ and says to him God be merciful to me a sinner that's what saving faith is we cannot be content just to preach the facts we cannot be content just to persuade people that gospel facts are true there must be telling and there must be persuasion but there must also be urging and beseeching and inviting and therefore if tonight you know the gospel facts and believe them to be true think hard it's not being here where those things are believed which makes you a Christian you have to ask the question has there been and is there still a personal approach by your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ who is declared in those facts have you been to the Son of God and personally asked him for the salvation which can be found in him have you been to the Saviour yourself and asked for cleansing have you been to Christ yourself and asked for forgiveness have you been to the Son of God yourself and asked for pardon have you cast yourself upon the Son of God have you addressed him not just the preacher but him 
Have you approached him? Have you prayed to him? Have you cast yourself upon him? Do you love him? Is the relationship with him? Because that's what faith is. Nothing less. And those who have not come to Christ will find that he that hath not the Son hath not life. Well, let's look secondly tonight at how faith behaves. That's what faith is. Now let's see how faith behaves. This is a further way of discovering whether the faith that you profess to have is a true faith. It's not enough to say faith trusts Christ. Because true faith trusts Christ alone. I've spoken to many folk in my life who tell me that they have a faith in Christ. And then they've gone on to tell me that they didn't believe that that was enough. That something else was necessary. Sometimes they said the Mass. Sometimes they said their good neighbourly works or something else. In other words, their faith is in two places. They cry out to Christ, but they also hope that their works, the things that they themselves can do, will somehow also win them God's favour and give them everlasting life. They think that salvation is a sort of mixture. God does half through Christ and we do the other half. God comes halfway down the stairs and we meet him halfway. And that's how we meet God. That's what they think. But true faith trusts Christ alone and relies for its acceptance with God on nothing else than Jesus Christ. Now you remember that famous passage which the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians 3. Listen to what he says. I might also have confidence in the flesh. I've got plenty to boast about. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. If you think you've got something to boast in, in religion, then I've, I'm, I've got more to boast in. Because he says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews. Nobody more Jewish than me, he says. As touching the law, I was a Pharisee. I was really hard working in trying to keep God's law. Concerning zeal, I was so keen, I persecuted the church. And when people looked at my life, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. When people looked at me, they couldn't find a fault. We're not in the same category as that, are we? All our neighbours and members of our family can look at things in our lives and they can find 10,000 things which they can blame us for. But they couldn't do that with Paul. The people who lived with Paul couldn't find anything to blame him for. They couldn't find a fault in him. They couldn't find a mark on him. He was altogether above them all. Well, Paul, do you rely on the fact that you're absolutely exceptional? Is that the reason why God is going to receive you into glory? Because you're a, you're a man like the world has hardly ever seen? Listen as he goes on. What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Those things don't even come into the reckoning. It's Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and, who, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I'm not right with God, says Paul, on the basis of my past life. In fact, when I look at that past life, I regard it as utter trash, garbage, absolutely not worth considering. If I'm accepted by God, and I am, he says, it's by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if anybody could have said, I'll trust Christ and something else, it was Paul. But he says, no, I'll be accepted by God on the basis of Christ alone. That's how faith talks. Now let me ask you a question. 
On the day when you read your Bible a lot and pray a lot and you can't think that you've fallen into any sin, do you consider yourself to be more acceptable to God than the days when you don't read your Bible, don't pray, and remember that that day was full of failure? Because there are many people like that. They think, I've read my Bible today, I've spoken up for Christ today, I've prayed today. As I look back over the day, it's been a good day. And in their heart of hearts, they think that they were more acceptable to God on that day than maybe the day before when they didn't manage to read their Bible, didn't pray, had all sorts of vicious and vile thoughts in their mind, fell into all sorts of things which they didn't want to fall into. And they thought, that day I was more acceptable to God than that day. That is trusting Christ and your works. Faith in Christ means that on the day that I'm a failure, I'm as, as mu I'm as much accepted in heaven as the day when I don't consider myself to be a failure. And my acceptance in heaven is based not upon my Bible reading or prayer or church attendance or witnessing or Christian giving or anything. But the only thing which I plead at heaven's bar to let me in and to be accepted there is what Jesus Christ has done and who he is and nothing else. That's how faith behaves. So not by works of righteousness which we have done, but of his own mercy he saved us. Now, the second part of how faith behaves is to tell us that faith becomes a sustained attitude. In Hebrews 11, chapter 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we read a definition of faith. Faith isn't just saying, ten years ago at such and such a place I came to Christ. Faith isn't just pointing to a moment in the past. Too many people's faith is in the day of their conversion and not in Christ. Faith is a sustained attitude. Faith is the substance or the conviction of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the assurance that what I'm hoping for I will get and the things that I cannot see really are there. Faith is something which becomes part and parcel of the person's character. They're not looking backward all the time to some experience, but they're remembering that they live in a world which is unreal because it's passing away and reality is the invisible. The Christ who came to years ago is an invisible Christ, but you're assured today as much as then and more so that the invisible Christ is a real Christ and the promises of Christ are certain to be fulfilled. And you look forward and hope for the things which are promised in God's word. And as a result, you set yourself to fight the spiritual warfare. You fight the good fight of faith, and you pick up the shield of faith. And you're aware that there are in, uh, invisible influences and forces at work in people's minds and in their words and in their actions. And that you will combat this evil on the basis of God's word and you're engaged in a spiritual battle in which the forces are invisible and you're not always harping on about what happened to you some great emotional thing years ago but it's become a whole attitude which marks you out as different from other people that's faith and so the net result, number three is a changed life if you keep Hebrews 11 open you go to verse 4. Faith makes a man offer his best to God. Do you? Verse 5. Faith makes a man reckon that walking with God is the most important thing in the world. Do you? Verse 7. Faith makes a man concerned for the salvation of his own household. Are you? 
Verse 8. Faith makes a man obey God even though he can't see where God's leading him. Do you? Verses 9, 10 and then 13 to 16. It's a bit of a much to ask you all to look at all at once. But faith makes a man live like a refugee in this world because he knows that the place that he's going to is better. Do you ever think like that? Look at verses 11 and 12. Faith makes a man believe that what men call impossible is possible with God. Verses 17 and 19. Faith makes a man obedient to God no matter what God demands. Look at verse 20. Faith makes a man concerned with the spiritual benefits of generations which have not yet been born. All this to make the point that faith results in a changed life. Look at verses 21 to 22. Faith gives a man confidence in the face of death. Look at verse 23. Faith makes a man cooperate with God's purposes as, uh, as best as he understands them. Verses 24 and 25. Faith makes a man live a life which is different and separate from the way that other people live. Verse 27. Faith takes away the fear of man because it's more important to please God than other people. Verses 28 and 29 show that faith leads to activity which springs from obedience. And so on, we could go down this chapter again and again and again to show that a man who has faith is not just a person who believes gospel facts to be true and has cast himself upon Christ. Because there are many people who really believe that they've done that, but there's been no heart in that faith. Real faith trusts Christ alone becomes an attitude and results in a changed life. Says James in his letter, if you say you've got faith but you've got no works to match that faith, your faith is a fake. But you might think you've got very little faith but you've got works that do match faith. That is the proof that your faith is real. It's a desperately sad situation, isn't it, that the word of God unveils to us again and again. That at the last day there will be men and women who will come to God's judgment bar and will believe themselves to be those who are about to be ushered into heaven and will find themselves instead consigned to damnation. And the reason will be that they have gone through this life believing themselves to be believers when in fact they weren't and have been conned by the devil and his deceits by false teachers and inadequate teaching and the deceit of their own heart to believe that genuine faith is something which they have when in fact genuine faith is something totally different do you know the great gospel facts do you believe them to be true have you come to Christ do you trust only Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ alone, nothing less but certainly nothing more for your acceptance with God? Do you believe that you live in the world where you're surrounded by the invisible which is more real than the things you can taste, touch or see? And do you believe that you live in the presence of that God who saved you and therefore you cannot possibly live like other people who ignore that God totally? The question is before us again then, do you have faith? Are you a believer? We read tonight, he that believeth on him is not condemned. Thank God. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God.